A lot of you have been watching the jinx involving Robert Durst and all the media that's followed since his arrest. But the show seems to raise more questions than it does answers. Questions like, was the evidence that resulted in his arrest in New Orleans really based on the TV show? And was the information that was on the TV show really something law enforcement has known for a number of years? And if so, why was he just now arrested? And importantly, was any of the activity from the producer, Jarecki, wrong in any way, legally or ethically? Good evening and welcome to HGCLA's Reasonable Doubt. My name is Carmen Rowe and I'm the president of HGCLA, the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association. We're the largest local criminal defense bar in the country. And tonight we have special guest Susan Chris, who is a former district court judge in Galveston who presided over the Durst trial, as well as local legal criminal defense lawyer, as well as nationally known criminal uh, legal analyst Brian Weiss, who both will talk about before during and after the jinx with our hosts, Jimmy Ardwan and Damon Parrish. Thank you, Carmen. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another edition of HCCLA's Reasonable Doubt. I'm your host, Jimmy Ardwan, along with my co-host, Damon Parrish. As Carmen said, we are going to have Susan Chris, former state district court judge and legal analyst for KPRC and criminal defense attorney Brian Weiss on our program tonight to answer all your questions about Robert Durst and answer our questions as well. We'll be taking your calls around 8.30 this evening and also we'll be taking your questions via Twitter at HCCLA underscore TV. So please send us your questions and call us at the 8.30 hour. Right now I want to bring in my co-host Damon Parrish. How are you? All right, yourself. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I want to talk about a couple uh, current event issues, Damon, before we get to our guests this evening. First off, I want to talk about Bo Bergdahl, uh, a U.S. soldier who was brought back from Afghanistan in a very controversial prisoner exchange uh, with some, some Taliban prisoners that were being held at Guantanamo Bay. Uh, it got a lot, of, a lot of national attention and created some um, controversy, let's say, let's put it Just that Just a little way. bit. Um, the military has decided to charge Soldier Bergdahl with uh, desertion. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. And I don't even know if I would call him soldier. Yeah. So in the exchange, it was a five to one ratio. We gave up five Taliban, uh, I don't know what we would call it, people, personnel, I guess, in exchange for Sar Sergeant Bergdahl, Bo. Uh, and President Obama, in the belief in the axiom, no soldier left behind, you know, bring our soldiers home, brought him home, which for that reason, we would tout him. However, didn't do an investigation, didn't do uh, speak to people, didn't work through Congress or, or military authorities. And apparently, Mr. Bergdahl wasn't a soldier in the sense that he went out on patrol, was out doing his duty, and was, and was captured. It appears he left his post. And he voluntarily, on his own, uh, on his own belief system, whatever, left his post, deserted his unit, unit deserted his position, deserted his post, uh, was captured by Taliban, held captive for five years, and was, re was released subsequent to the exchange process with President Obama. So now, flash forward, the military has done their investigation, spoke with military personnel, other soldiers, other officers around at the time, and have determined that Mr. Bergdahl, or Sergeant Bergdahl, is uh, a deserter, which carries with it a life imprisonment, if, if found guilty. Now, a lot of controversy with this because as Speaker Boehner, I guess it, it falls along party lines, Speaker Boehner has come out today and, and really, um, not only is he advocating about that Sergeant Bergdahl is innocent until proven guilty and really trying to uphold his, his trial rights, but what you see in this is Speaker Boehner going right at President Obama and saying that he never informed Congress of this, mm -hmm. basically accusing the President of uh, crimes, if you will, by not informing Congress about a prisoner swap and calling it an illegal prisoner swap. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so Speaker Boehner, Mitt Romney, other Republicans have said that they would have not have done this uh, swamp had they been president, which, you know, may or may not be true. And I don't know if President Obama should have went to Congress, but certainly should have went to military authorities, certainly spoken with those persons, those soldiers, those officers around Sergeant Bergdahl to see what was the circumstance of his capture. Uh, I don't think it's, it's widely understood that he wasn't necessarily captured in combat, but was just somehow missing and then captured. I believe if, if a little investigation, and once again, I understand the axiom, no soldier left behind, let's get our troops, let's bring them home. And I'm, I'm very much in support of that. I'm very much in support of bringing our guys home. Five Taliban guys aren't worth one American soldier. So I'm, I understand that. However, 
I think a little investigation on Obama and his staff, his part to figure out the circumstance of the arrest uh, or of his capture, should have been done to see if this where we want to show how much we support our troops and make this kind of trade, which has resulted in a soldier being brought home. And six, first of all, six soldiers were killed trying to find him. So we, we're, we, we don't mention those guys, but those soldiers have lost their lives trying to find him. And now we have this Bergdahl who's now home and facing a criminal charge, which could be life in prison. So I, I just think Obama should have, should have talked to somebody, Congress, military authority, or somebody, to decide whether or not this was where I want to draw my line in the sand, where I want to make this trade. Sure. It seems like the politics around this may be actually more interesting than the trial itself. As always with, with the president. Se second issue I want to get to uh, in, in the news this week, uh, charges against a UVA student, University of Virginia student. Now, U University of Virginia has been in the news a lot lately uh, over a lot of problems on campus uh, from the, f the fictitious Rolling Stone story. But this... Uh, this is another issue. There was a student who uh, was actually not a, a, a troubled student at all. In fact, a, a, a very good student uh, at UVA, very popular among the student body, uh, got into a, a bit of a scuffle with uh, the alcohol enforcement agency up in Virginia. He ended up bloodied and beaten and is now charged with obstruction of justice and a public intoxication charge. While it, it seems like, on the other hand, the governor and several other people are calling for an investigation of the officers. Right. And, and I think, so that student's Martise Johnson. He's 20 years old, so we can say his name. Um, I, you know, once again, we respect law enforcement. We always should. However, I think the proportion of their, their use of force against you should be in relation to the crime. Certainly, a, a, a juvenile or a 20-year-old in college, which we've all done, we all drank, we've all gone to college, we all drank in college from 18, 19, 20, 17, 16. Um, I don't know if the use of force to that extent is necessary to, to capture somebody who's just buying alcohol. What he was charged with was buying alcohol, uh, underage. He's 20. The law is 21. And from that, he got assaulted by the officer or whatever. Something happened to where him and the officer, altercation, and the pictures of his face look like somebody who, uh, who, who got beat. Uh, I'm not gonna say for any reason, but I certainly don't believe that uh, the purchase of alcohol underage merits that kind of response from an officer, that kind of aggression. Uh, like I've always said, we champion officers, we, we support them because they are trained to be better than us. They're trained to be calm when we are, uh, we would be aggressive. They're trained to run to a fire when we run from it. And so because of their training, they're taught to be more receptive, more calm, and to deal with situations that are more, uh, where, where aggression is called for, patience. I don't know what he could have done to merit that kind of abuse, yeah. that kind of assault. Well, it's another case we're going to keep our eye on, certainly, and see how it all plays out with the politics up in Virginia. Right. I want to bring in our guest this evening, former State District Court Judge Susan Chris, who presided over the Robert Durst trial in 2003, and criminal defense attorney and noted KPRC legal analyst Brian Weiss. Nationwide noted. That's right. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us tonight. We appreciate you coming on. Um, obviously, the big news we talked a couple of current events, but the big news, back in the news, Robert Durst. And <laughs> I want to start with you, Judge Chris, because you, not only have you been making the rounds, but you presided over this guy's <laughs> first trial. Um, and Did Brian been, pay you to say that? <laughs> no, but you've been very outspoken on, uh, on a, lot of, a lot of this stuff with, with the, obviously the jinx coming out on HBO, the documentary. Uh, I mean, you lived this case for a long time. Uh, he, was, he was charged in 2001 with the murder of Morris Black. Uh, the trial commenced in 2003, and, and eventually a plea deal was struck. And in fact, after he was released on parole, you encountered him at the mall. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your experience in that trial and, and what you saw uh, of Robert Durst as a person. He's a very fascinating person. When he first came to Texas, I didn't know what to think. I thought he might be crazy, as, as many people did. And sometimes he would act crazy in court. He would pretend to talk to imaginary people at the table. He would grunt like a pig at the council table and, and just try to make a spectacle of, of acting crazy in court. Right before we started trial, though, he, he gave me, a, he sent a letter to me through another lawyer. And regardless of whether he's right or wrong in what he said in the letter, he was having a dispute with his current attorneys about their fees and about whether they should charge him more or not. And 
the letter was handwritten from him, and I could see from that letter that this was not a crazy person, that this was a person who, who could reason, whether he's right or wrong about, about his perception of this, this was not a crazy person. And then we got these tapes from Pennsylvania. We got these two, 32 hours of taped phone uh, conversations with him and his wife and his friends and his sister where he discussed that he would pretend to be crazy in court. And so I got to listen to those and I got to listen to him having conversations about sometimes about very mundane things like what's on television and normal things that we all talk about and some pretty, pretty scary things. And, and one of the things he talked about that he was going to pretend to be act, pretend to act crazy in court. So once that happened, he stopped acting crazy in court and started acting normal. And he's a very complex person that uh, every time I think we we think we understand him. He does something to make us wonder whether we really do have a grasp on that. From now, you've been very. You were vocal about the prosecution and their lack of ability to to prosecute the case. I'm wondering, from from your perspective, you had a lot of personalities to manage in that trial. <laughs> clearly, <laughs> not just the defendant, uh, but you had Dick DeGaren, uh, you Dick had Mike DeGuerin, Ramsey, Chip Lewis. Yeah, Chip Parker. Lewis. Uh, I think the then DA Kurt Sistrunk was actually prosecuting the case. Um, so, ha for you as a judge, how did you manage not only the, the personalities, but the fact that the media is there every day, 48 hours is there covering the trial? For, for you, what was that like? Well, there were a lot of challenges, um, a lot of challenges brought to me by that case. And I was a pretty young, na young judge at the time. I'd maybe been on the bench just about three years. And I've been outspoken, but I've been outspoken recently now that I'm no longer a judge and I have more freedom to talk. Sure. But back then, I didn't have the freedom that I, that I have now to express my opinions. In the beginning, um, I knew that there was going to be a uh, national press and that it was going to be a different level than, I'd had high profile from Houston tele television stations and you know Texas news sources, but I'd never had that level before. And I was real worried about trying to figure out how to manage it from the point of view of allowing the press to see what's going on. I think that's very important. It's very important that the public know what's happening. I've, I'm very, very big on that. But also to make sure that it, that his the defendant's due process rights weren't compromised as a result of that and figuring out the best way to do it in a way where everyone's constitutional rights um, are protected and yet we we it, the truth for justice would not be compromised the the the, the path to justice would not be compromised so I I really I talked to a lot of people I tried to learn a lot and I will tell you that Brian Weiss is one of the persons who who I who I sought counsel from on how to do that and and he and I learned from him I learned from others I learned some of it from the media I learned some of it from other judges I have a very good friend who's a judge in California who in LA and Hollywood and she gave me a lot of counsel on on things to do and, and ways to manage it and in fact I heard from her today when now she's reading about the case out in LA but one of the things that really kind of um, I don't know, it just sort of it freaked me out a little bit, intimidated me a little bit, was that I was going to have a trial with Dick DeGaron. And this was someone who I was a big fan of. We, we, you know, he's on television all the time. He does have that big uh, personality and this big ego. And I don't say that in a negative way because I don't think he could be a good trial lawyer and not have a big ego. Sure. But I was thinking to myself, how am I going to manage that? I mean, he's strong-willed, and I think I'm kind of strong-willed, but I've never dealt with that. So and You are a judge, so. I'm a judge, but I was a new young judge. All right. Okay? And I, but I knew I had to keep control of the courtroom, and I was a little bit worried. Now, I didn't really know Chip Lewis, and I didn't know Mike Ramsey at the time. I've, I've grown to know them and respect them, but I didn't know them. But I was kind of worried about how am I going to handle Dick DeGaron? Yeah. Brian, from, I want to bring in Brian Weiss. Brian, you're no stranger to <laughs> high-profile <laughs> cases. You recently represented Adrian Peterson. You're part of his legal defense team. You represented Tom DeLay. Uh, you've had several other cases that have been in the news. From your perspective, uh, going back to that first trial, what do you think are the challenges faced by not just the defense lawyers, but the prosecutors and a judge in, in a case of that magnitude? Well, I mean, let me just say this at the outset. It is an honor to be here with Judge Chris, who has been on TV more than Leave It to Beaver reruns lately. I thought you were going to say it was an honor to be on the show with us. Th and, and, too. and that, too. Uh, and let me just say this. And she's no longer a judge, so I'm not even sucking up. <laughs> if anybody's ever heard me on the air or guest lecture at a CLE event, I talk about the role of a great judge being akin to a home plate umpire in Game 7 of the series. What do I mean? You call balls and strikes. You don't squeeze the strikes on people that you don't like. You don't care who wins or loses. And I want to say this about Susan. Susan did an incredible job of showing grace under pressure 
and a trial that was played out at four, five, six, and ten. That's number one. Secondly, the triumvirate of Dick DeGaron, Mike Ramsey, and Chip Lewis, and, and much like six degrees of separation of, of Kevin Bacon, Chip was a former student of mine. I got to try the Michael Brown case a couple of years ago right. with Dick, and I office with Mike Ramsey for two years. Um, Dick and Mike were, were always and continue to be my heroes. Um, any case is something that is going to give people gray hair and wrinkles before their time. But when you amp that up, oh, I don't know, 60, 70, 100 different times, because it's being played out on the national stage, it makes it that much more difficult. And like I said, Susan did an incredible job of not only managing the media, because it, as somebody who has been in the media since both you guys were bar mitzvahed, <laughs> um, you gotta understand, you know, they think that they're all that matters. Right. And, and they're there to do their job, and they want to advance the story, and they want to basically mark their turf. And when you complicate that with high-profile, big-ego people that we've already talked about, it, it makes a difficult job even more difficult. From, from the perspective of a defense lawyer, you've also got this added uh, complication, if you will, of a high-profile client whose family is worth billions of dollars. He himself is worth $100 million by the FBI's estimate. What is the difficulty as a defense lawyer in that case managing a high-profile client? Rule one in the playbook, when I talk to lawyers about dealing with the media, and that's one of the, the things that people actually think I know what I'm talking about, is it's governed by the Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. You know, when you as a defense attorney find yourself out there in front of the phalanx of cameras and the sat trucks and the live trucks, it, it, you're breathing rarefied air. But if you don't know what you're doing, you can easily go into a death spiral. And one of the virtual absolutes in the playbook is the lawyer does the talking, the client never does. Now, there are exceptions. Rusty Harden, who I had the privilege of serving uh, as co-counsel with in Adrian Peterson's case, uh, when Rusty represented Calvin Murphy 10 years ago on a variety of sex-related offenses involving his stepkids, Rusty was confident that Calvin had spent so much time behind the mic as an analyst for Rocket Basketball that he was comfortable in that spotlight, which is why I thought that I would have dated Jessica Alba before Robert Durst sat down in front of a microphone to talk to anybody about anything. And you talk about life's unanswered questions. Yeah. Is there life after death? Who killed Kennedy? Uh, you know, what do you guys do for a living outside of the studio? <laughs> and, and one of those questions is, what was he doing sitting down with Andrew Jarecki? Well, and I want to kind of go through the timeline here because we look, this really, this saga starts in 1982 with the disappearance of his first wife, Kathleen, in New York City. And then you have the death of Susan Berman in Los Angeles in 2000, in which the, the, the case that's now being investigated, the case he was just arrested on, she had information, uh, or they thought she had information that could provide, they could provide law enforcement with, um, regarding the death of Kathleen. And the theory is, according to the state, is that he shot Susan Berman uh, to keep her from talking to the police. And I want to talk about some of the kind of some of the evidence that's come out with regard to that, because the two big pieces of evidence that I see from the jinx uh, that I that I want to ask both of you about, both from a lawyer's perspective and from the judge's perspective, is we have this evidence of first off this letter um, that we saw. The the letter being uh, there was a, an anonymous letter written to the Beverly Hills Police Department, uh, and that went in 2000, basically saying you're going to find a cadaver in. Uh, in, in her, in Susan, Susan Berman's home. And what was then uncovered, I think, was produced to the Jinx producers, and they got this, was, was a letter that was then sent to Susan Berman in 1999, which they're now trying to link the handwriting to and claim that it is Robert Durst's handwriting. And along with that, there was the misspelled Beverly Hills, which they said right. had an extra E in it that was from Robert Durst. And, and, and so I want to start first, Brian, with you, because you're, you're a noted appellate lawyer. And I want to talk first about getting this handwriting in, handwriting experts, the handwriting sample. What are the challenges that the prosecution is going to face in terms of getting this in? First of all, and I'd love to know what Susan thinks, I think that the LAPD has got to have more than this Bush League confession in the restroom and the handwriting exemplars. Yeah. 
Um, what was funny about the jinx is that in episode six, and what they call in TV the cold open, they showed Chip Lewis, the handwriting exemplars, and, and Chip was trying to be cool. But at one point, he had that look on his face like I had when I would meet a woman on J-Date. I'm like, I'm like, this is, try to be cool. Um, you know, experts like Mark Twain said, just guys from out of town. And that doesn't bother me any more than this so-called uh, confession in, in the bathroom. You know, there are a thousand different explanations for it. I happen to think that he had an expectation of privacy in the bathroom. He's not in, you know, a stall at the Port Authority bus terminal. Well, and while you're talking about that, well, I want to read He was wearing a microphone. Yeah, so I want to read th the but quote. But he had a, a every reason to believe had been cut because they had struck the set, the interview was over. Uh, again, whether or not that comes within a code of pain of an interception of, of a communication that he hadn't consented to. Again, a thousand different explanations. I think what, what Dick is right. basically saying is that it was Shakespearean. Uh, and, and believe me, I can easily confuse uh, Hamlet with Robert Durst. I, I generally see them in the so same soundbite. So, Brian, do you think he was in character? With, like, he was just, just portraying a character when he made those statements? Do you even think he made the statements in the first place? I, you know, that's a, a, that's a great question. They're going to have to produce uh, something that leads us to believe the chain of custody hasn't been, been compromised. Right. But when I was in college, back in the day, there was an expression that we used to use. You were goofing on people. Right. Usually after you you know, smoke something or drink something. Maybe at the end of the day, Robert Durst was just goofing on, on Jarecki. I, I don't know. I, I do believe, and, and like I said, I'd love to know what, what Susan thinks, LAPD has got to have more than those two pieces of evidence. Well, let's ask Judge Chris, Susan, do you think on your own that that statement is enough to bring about where we are with, with Robert Durst? I mean, if we take that statement out of it, we see all six episodes of the Jinx. It ends. He doesn't go to the bathroom. He doesn't say, "What do I do? Well, I kill them all." He just it stops. Will we be where we are right now? Yes, we would. And I will tell you that I I do agree with with one thing that Brian said was that that we're all assuming that's all they have because that's what we've seen on television. But they have been working on this case for three years. The LAPD's been working on this case for three years. And the FBI's been working on the case separately for three years. And the FBI arrested him, not LAPD. And the FBI generally doesn't go serve warrants for local police departments, however big they may be. They've been working on this. And, and they've got, I would assume, they have a whole lot more. And we shouldn't know everything they have at this point. Or, you know, well, and I would point out to Cuba. that... that uh, Last week, James Comey, the director of the FBI, was in Houston, and it wasn't just to talk about task force. I mean, the, the, the rumor floating around was he was here because of what was going on with mm -hmm. Durst and the active investigation of that. And I, I do well, want to read the not quote. Not to mention that Susan Berkman died in 2000. So right. this, this going on, they've been investigating her death since 2000. It's, you don't think it's coincidental, Judge Chris, that after... 2015, Jinx airs. Now we have the evidence we need. Well, and, you know, 15 years have passed and we didn't have it before. Well, here's the thing. There, I, I think, I think that well, we've had the evidence. Evidence has been sitting unexamined is, for a long time, and and I, a lot of it was. Why, why was he arrested the night before the show aired? Because he watches television too, and he can read too, and he didn't know that that tape was coming out, but he knew something was coming out because. People were starting to talk about the fact that closure, there was closure had been guaranteed to some people that they would be getting closure Sunday night. And a lot of us thought that meant an arrest, but we didn't know, you know, what that meant. He knew that he was, when he was confronted with those letters, that, that was a big concern to him. Yeah. And since that happened, though, whether or not we think it's enough, he thought it was enough because he began preparing to leave the country for Cuba. He began secreting money and doing things right. that he needed to take care of business to do. So the rest came because the FBI was knowing that he can watch television and he can read and, and, and he has the internet, uh, can access the internet. He knew that he had a concern. So they thought when they realized he was gonna run, that's why they grabbed him. Not because it was the day before episode six, but because he was preparing to leave the country. And, and that's a great timing. point because this, right. Anybody who's ever watched Law and Order, ever heard Jack McCoy talk about consciousness of guilt, putting yourself in a position with what he had in the hotel room, with the exception of the weed, I I'll give him that, um, <laughs> in my estimation, is as damaging, if not more so, 
than this, you know, BS, uh, Hamlet-like confession or those handwriting exam exemplars. That to me shows that he knew at some point that the walls were closing in. And, and you can say a lot of things about Bob Durst. I don't think he's stupid. But he he's beat, not. He, 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 he's, not. he's evaded capture and arrest and, and conviction for at least one murder charge and maybe three more. So do you think what he saw right there was enough, Brian and Judge Chris, to say, you know what, now it's time to go? And, and that's my point. I, I think that's the consciousness of guilt that I, I think a skillful prosecutor is going to be able to make hay of. Right. Uh, but, but let me just say this. Th this notion that every time there's a missing person report, whether it's in Middlebury, Vermont, or in Salem, Oregon, you know, we pride ourselves on a level playing field and, and the notion that while justice is blind, it's not supposed to be deaf, dumb, and stupid. And I really think that it's, it's problematic to believe that Bob Durst may be responsible for as many uh, offenses as so many people think. Right. You know, let's try him for the Susan Berman case. Let's keep the playing field level. It's going to be a, a circus of, of, you know, Camp OJ proportions in the media capital of the, of the Western Hemisphere. And everybody needs to take a step back and relax and try this case fairly and kind of easing up on the whole, is he responsible for kidnapping Lindbergh? Well, and I, I want to ask you about that because, it, you know, you're going back to OJ, I mean, and all these things coming out, the missing Northern California girl, the, the Salem girl, the Vermont girl, is this something that he is going to be able to get a fair trial or are we looking at kind of a Howard Stern, people calling in with Baba Booey moments, <laughs> a la the OJ Bronco chase? I mean, is everybody going to be piping up and, and, and tainting any kind of jury potentially uh, and jury pool? What do you think about that? You know. It's interesting because where are we going to try this case? On Mars? Yeah. Um, it, at some point, we have to believe, even in a major media market like L.A., that there happens to be a segment of the population that <laughs> doesn't watch TV or read the newspapers or listen to the radio. And, and remember, because we've been through this, we've had so many high-profile cases in, in the greater Houston area. I've always believed it was the water. Take your pick. The test isn't whether or not a potential juror has heard, read, or seen anything about the case and may even have feelings. It's whether they can set those aside and judge the case fairly on the law and the evidence. But it, it's going to be problematic. I, I mean, it's not like they're trying this case in West Hartford, Connecticut. Right. I mean, this is market two. This is L.A. Um, I'm sure that the you know, L.A. County DA's office's gums are still bleeding from Robert Blake and O.J. <laughs> so it's going to be interesting to see how the judge who draws the short straw manages the media. I, I think I'm going to give him Susan Chris's cell phone number. <laughs> well, and, and actually, th if you think about this, when we tried him in Galveston, he was getting national media and he was being listed as a, a person of interest, if not a suspect, in three different murders. And I was asked in a motion in uh, Lemony to not allow any evidence of the of the Susan Berman or the Kathy Durst disappearance into evidence. And I was asked as a motion in Lemony. Now, the, the press didn't understand that, and they thought I was saying nobody could ever talk about that. I was saying you had to approach a bench first as lawyers know. And the, and the defense, as, as, as they should, got that granted. And then they jumped up. They jumped up and began proclaiming He's a suspect in these other cases, and yet, with Rob, with the work of Robert Hershorn, one of the best jury consultants in the world, they managed to get a jury. Of course, and maybe there's that was a very special jury. So, <laughs> so, but in this case too, you're talking at one of the things, and, and we also talked about should we change venue? What should we do? Where would you go? We had that same thing because. The, the, the coverage is national. The coverage is everyone gets this coverage. This isn't just the New York media or the L.A. media or the Houston media. And in this particular case, in the way, yes, it is the media capital of the world, but the people who are jurors are, are also used to that. I mean, they have to pick. They have celebrity trials there all the time. Yeah. We have a phone call coming in, so I want to get to our first caller of the night. Hello. Welcome to HECLA Reasonable Doubt. Hello. Interesting show. Is there any significance in the, the amount of marijuana? In the, because I think if he gets convicted in uh, Louisiana, he's going to do 10 years. He doesn't look like he has 10 years in him. Whereas while he's doing that 10 years, um, 
the people in L.A. could uh, get their case together better. Uh, you know, they probably could use 10 years. Sure. Thanks for the question. Um, Brian, the, the way I understand it, the possession of marijuana is really not the big charge in Louisiana. The felon in possession of a firearm, he was found with a 38 in the room, as I understand, and in Louisiana, that has the potential for life in prison. Right. With a mandatory minimum, as I understand it, of a decade yeah. Yeah. of 120 months. The caller makes a great point. Whether he has 10 years or 10 months in him, again, is one of life's unanswered questions. If, if you listen uh, to Dick DeGaron, uh, Dick believes that, that Bob is a very uh, sick man, a, a, a man whose health is, is problematic at best. You know, that's a great question. Bob Durst may never make it out of to Orleans. Hollywood, he of the Orleans Parish jail. Prison, yeah. uh, to be able to stand trial. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, it, Bob Durst, as Susan said, just when you think you understand him, you realize that you can't, like, like Churchill said about Russia, he's a riddle wrapped inside of an enigma. Trapped in the box. Well, so, box. Brian, uh, do you think, and Judge Chris as well, that maybe Louisiana, well, first of all, is it possible for them to just hold off on their charge and let the, what, what would be perceived as the greater charge, the murder of Susan Bergdahl, let that trial Susan go Berman. forward? Susan Bergman, I'm sorry. Let that go forth, and if that doesn't work, well, we got this fallback in, in, in Louisiana, or should Louisiana just go ahead and proceed forth and that'd be it? Well, the, the problem that I see is that in Louisiana, as in Texas, as in L.A., as in Connecticut, local prosecutors are elected. And, and this is Mr. Canizero's 15 minutes of fame. He's got one of the most publicized defendants in the Western Hemisphere in his jurisdiction. I don't think he wants to let him go. And this notion of, you know, interdepartment cooperation or whether or not he thinks L.A. County ought to have dibs on him, to use a legal term, uh, I don't know. I, is, is that Dibs v. Texas, by the way? Yeah, that was, yeah, it's in Ray, in Ray Dibs. In Ray Dibs. And that, to me, is going to be interesting to see how that plays out. I mean, apparently, assuming the arrest is legit, uh, it's a lay-down yeah. case. I mean, yeah. you know, we could yeah. bring in a, a third-year law student to try it. I'M NOT QUITE SURE WHETHER BOB DURST EVER GETS ON uh, CON AIR TO MAKE HIS WAY OUT TO THE I Capitol THINK HE board. WILL. SEE, I THINK HE WILL GET OUT THERE. AND LET'S NOT FORGET THAT IT'S NOT JUST UP TO THE DA IN LOUISIANA. BUT I AGREE WITH YOU 100% ABOUT WHAT THE MOTIVATION IS AND WHY THEY DON'T WANT HIM TO LEAVE THERE. I AGREE WITH YOU THERE. BUT YOU ALSO HAVE SOME PROSECUTORS IN L.A. WHO ARE ALSO CHOMPING AT THE BIT. AND THE FBI IS GOING TO GET INVOLVED. AND THE FBI, I THINK, IS GOING TO is going to be the one that takes them out to, the, to California. And that's not, and they're not through investigating him. In addition to that, I understand, I've heard all the uh, spin that the defense attorneys have put about how sick he is, but he wouldn't do, he wasn't too sick when he was setting up to go to Cuba. Well, and that, and that great shot, that still photo, and if, and if this were like a, a professional TV <laughs> thing, I could say to the producer, <laughs> Throw roll, it up roll, on that, the roll that clip uh, of him sitting in the back of the patrol car. He looks good. He looks great. He looks better than he did uh, through the first six episodes of the, of the Jinx. Yes. When I thought to myself, this man has is, is taken you know, more medication than, than any 50 people I've ever known in my life. God yeah. bless them. It's, uh, we, we've reached our halfway point in the show, so I want to remind our viewers, please send us your questions on Twitter at HCCLA underscore TV. You can also keep the phone calls coming in. We'll have the phone number at the bottom of the screen. We've got uh, a couple questions coming in about on Twitter about the, the show itself, The Jinx, and they want to know, is there any, any I guess, uh, punishment that the producers could face if they withhold any yeah, of Yeah, they're going to win an Oscar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a horrible punishment. They didn't withhold. They didn't? They didn't withhold. They turned... I know they, those producers have been working on that show for three years. They told me three years... Oh, no, sorry, they've been working on it for more years than that. I've been... Uh, known them for three years. And three years ago, they told me they found that. Now, they didn't tell me what it was, but they told me they got something from Sarab that implicated him in Susan Berman's murder, and they turned it over to the L.A. police. Just like we don't know all of the evidence that the police and the FBI have, we don't know everything that Mark and Andrew have given them, and I suspect that it's a lot. Well, Judge Chris, that poses another question. After 10, 15 years of, of investigation by LAPD, how did the producers get something that they didn't get, you know, you have this letter to, to Templar, how, how did they get something that... How did anything in this happen? How did, the, how did he get away with, with the, the investigation being bungled in, bungled in New York initially? How did he get away with what happened in Galveston? 
How did he get away with one handwriting expert thinking those things don't resemble each other at all, and national television, everyone thinks they look exactly the same? We see on we see, and it may have been, then they may have recreated this for the camera, but Sarah, who is Susan Berman's stepson, pulls out a box of things that were taken from Susan's home. We know that they believe that she was killed by somebody she knew, mm -hmm. somebody she was comfortable with, mm -hmm. and that that person, whoever the killer was, sent the cadaver note. Whether it's Bob Durst or not, the killers had to know that she was dead and have some culpability. Why didn't they look at everything in that box that, that Sarah passed? They, if they knew that it was someone right. that was connected to her, why didn't they look at the envelope that has Robert Durst and, and, and hurt and, and stuff to her? Why didn't they see the check the DNA under the envelope flap, under the stamp, why does Sarah have all that stuff if it's a pending investigation that's never been closed? Which you would imagine uh, Robert Durst coming and being investigated for murder in your county would spark that kind of investigation. And that's what I'm getting at. How, how did producers get it when, when they didn't? How did the, well, the police, I mean, you can't be mad at the, at the producers for recognizing the importance of something. That should have been every piece of Everything in her house should have been examined mm -hmm. closely. Now, oh, no, another thing, too, is we have forensic tests now that are more sophisticated that maybe there's things you could check now that you didn't know then. But why are they giving all that stuff to him when it could have evidentiary value? Right. You know, it's interesting because it's not a coincidence. I don't believe in coincidence. I don't either. Uh, Einstein said it's God's way of remaining anonymous, but it's not a coincidence that Mr. Jarecki is no longer doing any media. You know... Uh, yeah. Percy Foreman, right. who is the, the dean, the Babe Ruth of criminal defense attorneys here in Houston, used to say that if you could parade somebody into the well of the courtroom who the jury will hate worse than your client, you've got a shot. And the Galveston case, whether it was Morris Black or Janine Pirro, why do you think Dick and Mike and Chipper violated their own motion and limited to talk about the disappearance of Kathleen Durst because it gave them a villain. It gave them Janine Pirro with her blow-dried good looks and uh, Botox. And, and by doing that, they put Janine Pirro and Morris Black on trial and they got a, the two-word verdict. In this case, I don't think you need to be the Chief Justice of the United States to recognize that the defense is going to put Andrew Jarecki on trial. And as long as they can do that, They've got a shot. Can you think of another case, Brian, where a, a defendant has done a high-profile documentary and that documentary was used in the trial? <laughs> Let me help you out here. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just the same question. I can't. I, in fact, I said that last week. There is no precedent no. for a defendant giving his own confession when he's not even being questioned on national TV. But is it really a confession? I, I want to read the quote uh, because here's, here's what it was said when the bathroom is, quote, there it is. You're caught. What a disaster. What the hell did I do? Killed them all, of course. I mean, it, it, it kind of sounded like the ramblings of a drunk man on Percocet. But at, at the same time, is that really a confession? Well, I mean, here's the thing. You have to look at everything in this case in context. And during an earlier episode, he knew he was mic'd up. And they took a break, and he began mumbling to himself, what looked like he was mumbling to himself. And what he was doing was practicing how he was going to answer the question about whether what the specific lies were that he told during our trial. And a lawyer comes running around the side telling him, stop, stop, stop. And he learns the lesson that he should have learned a long time ago, that I know the Brian and I know, <laughs> don't keep talking until they take the mic off of you. And when the, the, that red light's still going. So he's already learned that lesson. In addition to that, during our trial, we got 32 hours of taped phone conversations that he knew he was being taped. And they said all sorts of incriminating things. So he, he knows that he has a history of mumbling. And I think when we talk about the context, we, all, we didn't see every moment that he was taped, that uh, knowing or unknowingly, okay? Sure. And I'm sure that, that when you have to, to look at that, you have to look at the whole context of what he said. And we only saw a part of it. We saw the edited part. Right. And I'm not going to suggest that Mr. Jarecki would ever doctor evidence that he had control over. But if anybody was a fan of one of my favorite shows, The Newsroom, in the second season, there was a question about whether one of their senior producers doctored an interview to be able to say something that ultimately wasn't true. We don't know. Susan's right. It's the C word. It's, it's context. We don't know the outtakes. We don't know what they have. We don't know what they've turned over to law enforcement. Um, but there are two rules in TV. Number one, you always have to assume your mic's hot. Susan and I talked about that at length. And number two, is, again, if this is a, 
a professional TV studio, you have to assume you're always in a two shot, which is why <laughs> I actually was on TV, and I'll tell you this quick story. Uh, I was on TV with Janine Pirro. I want to say we did Greta, and it was during Andrea Yates. And I'm on and I'm talking, and obviously when you're on, you don't know who, what the other person is doing because I have them turn my monitor off. It's like it's, you don't want to watch yourself on TV. And when it's over, I talk to my mom, uh, God rest her soul, Funny Weiss, and I would always talk to her when I would get done with a national shot. I'd say, Mom, what would you think? She goes, who was that bitch you were on TV with? <laughs> I said, Ma, that was Janine Pirro. She's the, the DA in Westchester County. She goes, I don't care who she is. I'm going to drive down there and hop her ass. I said, why? She goes, because she was making faces when you were talking. She was like, so again, rule one, rule two in the playbook, your mic's hot, you're always in a two-shirt. <laughs> we got another call coming in. <laughs> Hello, welcome to HC Still a Reasonable Doubt. Did Brian Weiss just say he doesn't like to watch himself on TV? <laughs> 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 I've got it on yeah. tape. Okay, hi guys. Uh, Todd DuPont here. Hey Todd, how are you? Todd. <laughs> okay. Um, kind of a lot of things going on in the show tonight. Uh, first time to watch uh, you guys' episode. Uh, the background and, and the format looks great. Thanks. Um, I'm going to want to kind of. Obviously, Durst is hot in the news right now. Uh, and. I'm going to uh, point a question to uh, Judge Chris. Um, it just seems like that uh, her comments are perhaps uh, yielding themselves to get to the point that it's not um, promoting confidence or integrity or impartiality uh, as, as she presided over the trial. I'm not commenting. I wasn't there. I'm sure she can verify that, but um, it just seems like at this point, her comments, and if you if you Google Durst name in the media, uh, which I did about an hour ago, her name comes up just as prominent. And so it just seems like that uh, I don't know. Do we want past judges presiding, commenting on pending cases? That's my thought. Sure. Well, I was a judge for 15 years, and during those 15 years, I did what I thought I had to do to be impartial in every case that I had. And as a judge, you have to call each shot as you see it. And one of the most frustrating things about that case was, well, in any case, as, let me tell you this, as a judge, it's the easiest when both sides are doing a good job. Then all you, then it's, that's when your job is easiest. When one side is not, you can't do their job for them, whether it's the defense or the prosecution. Mm -hmm. And that's very frustrating because you still have to, to call each shot as they are. And I did that in this case, even though I could see that train wreck coming, that justice, I didn't think justice was going to be served because one side wasn't doing their job. I've seen a lot of criminal trials where I thought the defense wasn't doing their job and justice wasn't going to be served, and that's also frustrating. And if the person's uh, retained their attorney, there's not a lot you can do there, too. I had rules back then, and the reason that you have to show that... There, once The reason you don't speak out as a judge is that you don't want to be considered Im to be impartial in the future if you're ever asked to do something again. I, when I stopped being a judge and I became a criminal defense attorney again, I don't have to be impartial anymore. I sat through six weeks of testimony, a year and a half at least of, of, of evidence, and I saw evidence, and I ultimately became a witness, and my obligation to, be, to remain impartial ended. Well, and, 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 you know, first of all, I'm surprised that I didn't think they had cell phone reception upstairs at Char, so I'm surprised that uh, the caller was able to get through. I mean... <laughs> Yeah, the, the rule calls at all times. There you go. Great. Um, you know, here's a sports analogy for you. The people that had the over-under on sports analogies tonight that had five should have bet the over. You know, they say in, in, in big league baseball, good pitching stops good hitting. In the real world, in the criminal justice system, good defense attorneys beat good prosecutors. And with all due respect to the, to the guys who prosecuted this case, there were great lawyers that outclassed prosecutors who, who did not bring their A game. And 
to me, one of the turning points in this case was twofold. Number one, hiring Robert Hirshhorn to come in, who I've worked with multiple times to pick the jury. That's a game changer, number one. But number two, at the time, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, the first assistant in the Galveston County DA's office was a guy named Mo Abraham, who pound for pound was one of the best trial lawyers in that courthouse. And for some reason, they shunted him to the side. Clearly, Kurt Sistrunk as the DA was going to have his moment in the sun. And they brought on Joel Bennett, who, as I understand it, caught the case at intake. And, and I went on the air, and I said it then, and I'll say it now. Leaving Mo Abraham on the sidelines in this case was like making Steven Spielberg a production assistant on Schindler's List. I don't understand it. And if you look up at the, at the video that they posted, right there, Joel Bennett looks like the Maytag repairman. He is the loneliest man in the world in the wake of that two-word verdict. Well, so, let me, Agreed. so, Brian, let me ask you a question. Uh, well, but if, if I may, I'm the caller. <laughs> uh, Brian, you said to keep it proportional, all right? Agreed. But if the national media and this dude, and I'm not a Durst proponent. I've never represented the guy. I, I have zero interest in this. However, post that trial, and now in the wake of his future dealings, we have a ex-judge that's commenting publicly about this. Does that keep it proportional? I'm just asking. I don't know about proportional. I know, I know there is, Todd, is, is I understand the, the code of professional conduct. Susan has every right to state her opinion about events that have happened in the past. There is a freshness expiration date on trials, just like there is on cottage cheese and bad marriages. And so, as I understand the code, and, oh yeah, wait a second. Yeah, the First Amendment, she has every right to speak her mind. Now, whether or not people agree with that, or whether or not I happen to agree with, with some of her sound bites, Look, we're like an old married couple. I mean, I don't agree on every, with everything she's happened to say about this case, but I believe she has the right to fairly comment on it. Well, so, Brian and, and, and Judge Chris, I have a question for you. And I've long since thought that the media gives a defendant the most fairest trial. That when you have O.J. Simpson, you have uh, Casey Anthony, you have Durst, you have a lot of people in the media who on the onset seem guilty, and then when the media is there, they get the fairest trial. And then also we have money. So do you think media and money played a hand in Durst getting not guilty? I'm not sure what you mean. You mean the media as far as how they report on him? Or the... I'm not sure what as you mean the media the, give him a fair trial. The constant, constant vigilance of the media there reporting on every aspect of the case. Oh, the as scrutiny. opposed to just... Right. As opposed to just the onset charge, now guilty. The step-by-step, -step, knowing that the media is there watching your every move. No, I don't, because I think sometimes... I think sometimes that might work to the opposite effect. I think, I think, I think in, in both in politics and in the justice system, I think we do two things. I think we humanize people and we demonize people. And defense attorneys try to humanize their client, the prosecutors try to demonize the client, and the media tries to figure out which one of those uh, categories will sell the, will, will make a better story. And you see that in, in politics too. And I think that's why when you have a celebrity if the, if the defendant can humanize the person, they're more likely to get them off. And so I think some people are more likely to be humanized or demonized or easy to be humanized or demonized. And I think, I don't th I think that can go for you or against you. And, and I disagree with your premise, at least here locally. I've been involved in a couple of high-profile cases, number one, with Dick DeGuerin, uh, the late, great Dr. Michael Brown. Let me tell you something. I was down there, and unless they were covering a trial that I wasn't attending, they had this guy guilty of, of everything except office detention in the fifth grade. That's number one. Number two, Kent Schaefer, one of our friends, pound for pound, one of the best criminal lawyers in Texas, and I were part of a pro bono team that represented a woman named Ashley Benton, who was accused of killing an MS-13 gangster in Chew Park in, in 2006. And what was so funny... But, it, but Michael Brown won. He was found he, Yeah, Hitchcock. but not because of the media. Trust me, I'm a doctor. But in the Ashley Benton case, what was so funny is that Kent is dismantling these lowercase wannabe thugs. And I would go home in time to generally watch the news. And again, I'm a legal analyst for KPRC, Channel 2, where local news used, used to come first. We can't say that anymore. And Phil Archer, <laughs> cowboy Phil, who has been a reporter in this market since the summer of 42, uh, would report on the case, and he would say, Ashley Benton, 
on the grassy knoll in 63. And I'm, I would see him, I'd say, Phil, did you watch the same trial that I watched? And, and again, even Adrian Peterson. It, it, it does help if you're an NFL all-star and MVP. But ESPN didn't exactly give us a fair shot. The chuckleheads at Sports 610 Radio who leaked those CPS pictures and who are going to have to answer to a higher calling other than Rusty Harden and Brian Weiss. No, I, I think it depends on the defendant. I think it depends on the media. But no, I certainly in my estimation, uh, the media is like the government. They're not here to help you. We got one more call I want to try and get to before our show ends tonight. Hello, welcome to HCC Reasonable Doubt. Yes, do you, does his dream team get credit for the Jinx interview? I mean, were they consulted? And also, is it wise to go with the same team? I mean, I mean, no way they're going to get two uh, equivalents in a row. Uh, because I think to, to be in a murder charge, you need a lot of luck, and they used up all their luck and. Should, should he get another team, especially out of state, you know, who, uh, well, I guess they'll have jury consultants, but um, shouldn't he, they have local lawyer, a, a local dream team? Sure. And I can't believe he was complaining about his legal bill. <laughs> well, it, seems, uh, it seems like complaining about your legal bill is indiscriminate right. about how much money you have. So, um, but what about that, Brian? I mean, he's going to get local counsel. He's already oh, got local yeah. counsel. Look, in New rule Orleans. one in the playbook is you don't argue with success. Right. I think that we're going to see Robert Hirshhorn picking the jury in L.A. Uh, I think Dick will be involved. Dick is is the quarterback right now. But L.A. Is a, is a company town. It's incredibly parochial. And like any other case, whether we're talking about going to Dimebox, Texas, and, and talking to somebody as local counsel who used to play Little League with the judge's family, um, there are so many good lawyers, so many great lawyers in L.A. And I know that there have been preliminary feelers, if you will, about who is going to be part of that team. This is that rare case, you know, F. Scott Fitzgerald said, the rich are different from you and I. And, of course, Hemingway's response was, yeah, they have more money. My take is they get to hire better lawyers. And money is not going to be an issue. I think that the team that they put together, my only concern is that Dick, who is still the gold standard, has got to understand that that Stetson may not play on Hollywood Boulevard like it does down the street at the Criminal Justice Center. We've got a personal question for you, Brian, from one of our personal. viewers. Whoa. And uh, they want to know what kind of candy you like and if you still buy it at CVS. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love Kit Kats, but, but keep keep Bob away from the, the Kit Kat at the CVS. We'll be fine. Right. Of course, he had the he had that infamous charge at CVS for urinating on candy, and I right. pled no contest to that. And that's in Harris County. Right. <laughs> if it was Your in local County. CVS. Um, I, I, there's another question coming in, and it talked about um, Robert Durst's wife, and she is supposedly in trouble for helping him make preparations to flee for Cuba. Uh, is this someone so that you guys see that the prosecutors will go to and try to make a deal with to testify against Robert? I could, I could definitely see that happening. I mean, I think they are going to, I think they are going to um, be more aggressive about trying to get people to testify and. I think that I could see that happening. But doesn't spousal immunity cover her testimony as, as far as what he may have told her? I don't think they're going to be going after her for what he told her. I think they're going to be talking about whether she participated in helping him escape and what she did. I mean, then that's just a guess, right. but that's just a guess I, I mean, have. if Susan and I are married, uh, yeah, God willing. Congratulations, uh, by the way. Thank you, Mazel Tov. And, and we're co-conspirators in a, in a drug case. The fact that you know, we share the marital bed doesn't mean that they can't roll her against me sure. based upon her I'd never testify against you, though. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> she says that now. I, but oh. you have it on TV, so we, if it ever changes. Do, just like I don't watch myself on TV. There, there have been a number of lies told here tonight. <laughs> we, we only have a few minutes left, but I want to circle back to one thing that you mentioned, Judge Chris, and that was about the FBI potentially grabbing Durst, and that may be the catalyst that gets him out of New Orleans. Um, Realistically, and, and either one of y'all take a stab at this, do you think the FBI is going to intervene and try and take it away from the local DA? And do we expect to see any federal charges out of this? I think that the FBI has been working on this for three years. And they don't go, like I said, they don't go serve local warrants for, for departments. That doesn't happen. Um, whether they have enough to prosecute him on federal charges, I don't know, but I, I know they're working on it. And a lot of people assume, well, because 
because there's no bond in Louisiana, that means California can't get them. They're called bench warrants. They're called bench warrants. And, and, and at some point, a judge will decide whether or not he could be bench warranted to California. And I don't think, I don't think Louisiana gets to say, hey, we got them. You can't have them. Well, explain how that process works, because here you have an out-of-state out judge. It'd be one thing if it was another judge in Louisiana potentially bench warning him, say, from, you know, from New Orleans to Lafayette or Baton Rouge. But how would it work? How would a bench warrant work between you know, Los Angeles and New Orleans? He, he could go back every week if, if they wanted him to. I mean, that's... I mean, look, a, the, the FBI, order. they're the toughest kid in the yeah. schoolyard. Make no mistake yeah. about that. And if they believe they can make a case against Bob Durst for interstate flight to avoid prosecution or that he traveled in interstate commerce to allegedly uh, kill Susan Berman, I, right now we are looking at the proverbial tip of the iceberg. What we know about... California versus Bob Durst or, or Louisiana versus Bob Durst or God knows what else. It, it's the 10 percent above the North Atlantic. It's that 90 percent that sunk the Titanic that may yet sink Bob Durst. Well, so can the FBI, I mean, federal charges won't be for murder, correct? So well, the, the, the greater charges would be in California for murder and Louisiana for possession of a firearm. I'm not, not going to presume. Away, I'm not going to presume. I guess my question is, if there is a way that there's federal jurisdiction where the toughest kids in the schoolyard basically get to tell the people in Louisiana, thanks for being on the show, we got some lovely parting gifts, right. um, we don't know. And like we say in TV, no word on that yet, Damian. And, would they still try the federal case, though, in Louisiana since... They can try the federal case. They can try it anywhere, so they can try it in Louisiana. Well, right? the federal case, though, they've been working on that all over the country. They've been working on the federal case for a long time. They've had a wire, they've had a, I'm sorry, a pen register on him as he traveled from state to state, and we don't know what's on there. We don't know what, what they have and what they don't have. And uh, I think there's, like you said, there's so much we don't know that we're presuming that what we see is the whole case, and we don't know that. It's the big reveal. Just like part yeah. six of the jinx, the yeah. big reveal is going to be what law enforcement has that's ultimately, in their mind's eye, going to bring Bob Durst down. I also predict in episode best seven. For <laughs> well, Brian Weiss, Susan Chris, we thank you all for joining us this week. It has been a pleasure and it has been one of the most more entertaining shows <laughs> from the last standpoint or the personality standpoint. This, so right. this Do you not usually talk about marital beds between your, your people went by on there? Quicker than exactly. Kim Kardashian's first marriage. I mean, what what happened here? It was it was way too Wait, much. She was fun. married thank twice? It was a combination was. of Kanye wasn't guys. the first. Thanks, we, guys. we appreciate it. We will we we're gonna wrap things up for now and we'll see everybody next week. Carmen Rowe will be filling in for me next week as I will be on vacation, everybody. So thank you. Keep your Twitter, Twitter questions coming in. Call us next week and follow us on Facebook. Thank you very much and good night.